Good Thursday morning, everyone. Pastor Rob here. We are in Mark 14 today. Man, a lot of stuff has happened the last few days. We had Halloween. We had the elections. And and we also uh, filmed Grandma's Kitchen uh, right after, I think it was Tuesday. We did Tuesday night. We did Grandma's Kitchen. We have a new a new recipe coming out for everybody watching or interested. And it's uh, Grandma's Strawberry Parfait Pie. Be it, but it's going to be a fun episode, I hope. It's a... Uh, Casey's editing that, and we will get that out hopefully later this week. We have an interview with Sam Gill on Saturday at 10 in the morning. That's going to be recorded and released next week. Sam is a uh, 12, 13. He was born in Pakistan. We went to school together in Cincinnati, and now he's got a church in Pakistan and a school and uh, just doing a great job over there. We're going to interview him Saturday morning, and then hopefully have that out later that week. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to that. So getting the, the time zone changes there are pretty tough. He's, he's eight hours ahead, I believe. So anyway, I hope everybody's doing good. We're in Mark 14. This is our lesson number 48 in the book of Mark. We are in the last week of Jesus's life. Some people say Wednesday is the lost day. I don't know. I'm not a time guy in the Bible, but I, I thought that this was Wednesday. And Jesus has been going back and forth between uh, Bethany, uh, the Mount of Olives, Jerusalem, and basically every day he's teaching in the temple grounds. It's his last week of his life. The priests are still hunting him down. They want him dead. They're going to find a way to do it. But remember in John chapter 10, it says that nobody's going to take Jesus' life away from him. Uh, he will lay it down. That's a quote from Christ. He said, nobody takes my life away from me. I'm going to lay it down. So what does that mean? He's in perfect control. Just like today, after the elections, all the turmoil in the world, God is in perfect control. At any time, he can do anything he wants. And remember, though, we, we have two timelines running parallel with each other. So just keep in mind, it's something to think about when you read your Bible. There's a sovereign timeline. You know, if you look at Galatians 4.4, 4, in the perfect time, Jesus came to the earth. Nobody takes my life before my time. There's a sovereign timeline. God has a plan the, from beginning to end. That is never going to be interrupted. He will do what he does because he said he will do it. And in that, uh, below that timeline is our own timeline. In time, we have life. We have an opportunity to spend a short time in time on this earth and do what we do and enjoy life and to worship our Lord. And, you know, we get to give account for that at the end of our time in his timeline eventually will enter that sovereign timeline in eternity so just keep that there's two parallel these two timelines run together they run god gave us time it's ours we can do what we want with it we sometimes we do good sometimes we don't do very good so but in god's sovereign timeline nothing's going to change from creation to his second coming there is a timeline that he has set that only he knows and he will intervene when he's ready but always remember just like as, this, as we lead up to his crucifixion, Jesus is in perfect control. He is not going to be taken by surprise. He knows what's coming. He's telling everybody what's coming. And he's telling everybody, get ready, because I'm going to the cross. Just like he told everybody in the last chapter, Mark 13, get ready, be alert. I'm coming back. That's the sovereign timeline. That's going to happen. So just keep that in the back of your mind as you read the Bible. There's two timelines, sovereign timeline, our timeline, which is, where we get to exercise our free will and do what we will with our time. So this is probably Wednesday. Jesus, again, final week of life, going back and forth from the Mount of Olives to uh, Jerusalem, teaching daily. So he'd spend the night over the Mount of Olives. He'd come back over and teach daily in the temple. And, uh, and eventually soon we'll be in the upper room. That'll probably be sometime tomorrow, like Thursday. And Thursday, he spends the final night. And that's John chapter 13 through 17, by the way. That is one night. Just remember that. Some people don't know that. But John chapter 13 through 17 is literally the Thursday night that Jesus spends with his disciples, his final night on this earth, in the upper room with his most intimate group. And that's when they have the Last Supper and all that. So this is where we're at today. We're in Mark 14. It looks like we are um, in Wednesday of Jesus' final week of life. He's going back and forth to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem to the Mount of Olives. And uh, we'll go ahead and start in, in uh, uh, John, um, excuse me, Mark chapter 14, verse 1. It says, now the Passover, this is where I get my day. So this is, you can argue with this or add your own comments there if you want, if it's uh, uh, about the timeline here. But now the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread 
We're only two days away. So that's Friday, perhaps. So we're saying this is Wednesday. And the chief priests and teachers of the law, we're still looking for some way to arrest Jesus. They're plotting. How many times have we seen that? Over and over. Um, they're looking for a way to arrest him. Uh, but not during the feast, they said, or the people may riot. So they're being strategic. They don't want to they don't want to riot because they may become the victims in their own public unrest that they cause. So <clears throat> just remember that. So we're, th we're Wednesday. They're trying to arrest him. Again, they're not going to arrest him until Jesus says, okay, I'm ready to be arrested. And they think they're in control, but they're not. Uh, and the Passover, by the way, just a side note, how do we know Jesus had three to three and a half years of ministry? Because if you look in the book of John, and I'm going to go, that'll be our next book. I'm going to do that next, uh, hopefully. And um, basically, those three days, uh, three Passovers show that there was three years Jesus came back to Jerusalem. And there is time, and I'll point those out when we do join. We count his three-year ministry because three times he returned to Jerusalem as he was ministering during his ministry on this earth in his adult life. And he was there three times, so that's three years possibly of his ministry. So just that's how we get the timeline of his three-year ministry. So um, he's in he's in Jerusalem. He's teaching the, the priests and the prophets. Excuse me, excuse me, the priests uh, and the teachers of the law were looking for <clears throat> a way to arrest him and kill him, but not during the feast. <clears throat> Gosh, excuse me, um, not during the Passover feast or the people may riot. Why? Because they liked him. They loved Jesus. He was very popular, um, and so he's probably got twenty, thirty, forty thousand followers following him around. He has an intimate twelve. His inner circle of three, Peter, James, and John, and then probably 120 or more that are like really close. But then there's a group of people that follow him everywhere. So while he was in Bethany, reclining in, uh, at the table in the home of a man known as Simon the leper, a woman came in with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard, and she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. So she's pouring this on his head. If you look in John chapter 12, there's also another account prior to his triumphal entry when another woman comes in and anoints his feet and uh, then he makes a triumphal entry. So we know it looks appears that he was anointed twice, once on his feet, once on his head, once prior to his triumphal entry, once after. And both times Judas complains that that jar could have been sold. That jar of perfume was very expensive. We could have sold it and we could have taken the money and given it to the poor. Now we know Judas doesn't mean that because also in John chapter 12, it says he was a thief. He used to steal the money from the treasury. He carried the money, uh, the money bag for the disciples. And it says he often helped himself to what was in it. So the first time he's anointed, Jesus is anointed, his feet are anointed. The second time his head is anointed. And both times Judas complains. This is just a rough thing. I try to put this together. But it appears that the first time Jesus rebuked Judas, he was upset. The second time, this time was too much. And this is going to be the time when he goes and makes a deal with the priests. So let's take a look at that. So uh, they were in the house of a man called Simon the leper. A woman came in with an alabaster jar, a very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar, poured the perfume on his head. And in John 12, it says, it was poured on his feet prior to his triumphal entry. Judas complains both times. Some of those presents were saying indignantly to one another, why waste this perfume? Now, that's a joke because that's hypocritical. Remember, two chapters ago, we were in the temple, and they were getting tons of money in the temple poured into the treasuries. Two great applause, by the way. If somebody brought in a lot of money, dumped it into the temple treasury, there was great applause, great fanfare, and people loved that attention. They had plenty of money. They didn't need money. If they were really going to do what was right for the poor, they would have taken the money out of the temple treasury and helped people. Because then, remember, the widow came in with her two cents, dropped it in, no fanfare, no nothing. And that's when Jesus says, I've had enough. So they could have taken care of her if they really meant that. This is a hypocritical statement. They mean this by no means other than maybe Judas was um, upset that he could have had that money. And these people uh, are just being hypocritical. They never used the money to help the poor. Anyway, that's why Jesus destroyed the temple. So some of those presents were saying indignantly to one another, why waste this perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wage and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Women were second class citizens. The men were going to attack her. By the way, if you are a woman and uh, Jesus often defended women, the first people to see 
uh, first people see him alive was a woman. The, the women who provided him in Luke chapter 8 were women. They provided for him out of their sustenance. Jesus often came to the aid of women and defended women, and, and rightfully so, because they were, they were abused and treated uh, poorly during this time. So I would say people complain about the church, you know, the Christians of, you know, are hard on women and stuff like that. Other than the office of pastor, where men take a stand, and the, the Bible takes a stand, where women should not be leading churches or leading men in the church, that's a position held for men. I didn't write it. God did. That's probably the only thing I could see. But women have a very, very important role in the church. And Jesus often came to their aid, supported them, lifted them up. And, and if you read Ephesians 5, men in leadership positions, husbands and, and so on, should honor women honor their wives and respect them. Uh, and so, so, I mean, if you've got a, a good woman, uh, you are a team and that's fantastic. So you've got something special if you've got a good woman supporting you in ministry or in life and so on. So they rebuked her and then Jesus comes to her aid and says, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. This is something that you should notice too, as a woman, as a guy, whatever, um, that she knew who Jesus was. She believed who he was, and that was Messiah. She's anointing him because she believes. She has faith. The men, they ain't getting it yet. Uh, and that's why they rebuke her. Had they recognized who he really was when she did this, they would have acknowledged that what she did was very special. And it's interesting that since this moment happened, and it was recorded to today, this is a, a moment that is in, left in our memory and in our Bible for our benefit and Jesus even says that, that this will be a story told till the end of time. So he comes to her aid after she anoints his head. And he, why are you bothering her? They're complaining because she uh, spit, they could have taken that again. Uh, they could have taken that money and given it to the poor. They weren't going to do that. There was truly no intention there. They just wanted to attack her. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Look at, leave her alone. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Uh, what she has done will be last, will be told forever. The poor you will have with you, and you can help them anytime you want. Jesus calls them out. The poor you have with you, look around. There's poor everywhere. The widow is just that you're in, in the temple. You did nothing to help her. The poor you have, why are you going to have the poor always? Because you're doing nothing to help them. That's why you're going to have the poor. So don't be, you know, he know he's calling them out. You're lying. You are not going to spend that money in the poor. You're going to pour it on yourself, indulge in whatever it is that makes you feel good. You're not going to help the poor. So Jesus calls them out. The poor you will have with you, and you can help them anytime you want. And they don't. Again, that's why, again, I, I always will say that the widow's might, when Jesus saw that happening, and she gave all she had to live on, that really was the, the what they say, the, the thing that broke the camel's back, so to speak. And Jesus left the temple. So the poor, you have it, you can help them anytime you want, but you will not always have me. So he knows he's going away. He knows he's going to be arrested. He knows he's going to be crucified. And he's telling them uh, in, in his you know perfect knowledge that he's going to be crucified. He knows he's going away. She did what she could. He's defending her again. She did what she could. Remember, Jesus always says, I don't care. There's a situation. If there's a situation, this is an example, the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus did not harass the disciples, so you need to figure out the situation. He said, bring me what you have. If you're in this world today and you're trying to serve God, there, you don't have to be prototypical. You don't have to be wealthy. You don't have to be multi-talented. Bring what you have and place it in the hands of the master and say, God, this is all I have. Do what you can with it. And in the hands of the master, Jesus Christ. You can do much more than you ever imagined by bringing what you have. And this is what she did. She did what she could. What she had, she saved this perfume possible for her wedding day. Something very expensive. She probably saved her whole life. And uh, and she poured this on Jesus' uh, feet, or his head, excuse me, his head. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body before uh, beforehand to prepare for my burial. Again, foreshadowing to his crucifixion. Uh, and his burial. I tell you the truth, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Look how he rushes to her defense. Uh, so just a message of hope and those, I've, I've been there, so I know, not to get into detail, but I know women often think they're discriminated in the church. Again, I say other than the office of pastor, women can do whatever, you know, whatever they can in ministry, whatever talent they have, 
lead children, lead Bible studies, lead women's uh, ministries, whatever they can do, bring what you have. The office of pastor is reserved for men alone. But um, he comes to her defense, and he defends her. She came in. She did what she could. And Jesus often does that for women. He does support them and looks out for them. What she has done will also be told in memory of her. Not only is he defending her, but he's saying this story, this woman, and what she has done is so special that in 2024, not he obviously didn't give the date, but they'll still be talking about her. And here we are today. He defended her. This whole verse from verses 6 to 9 are a defense of this woman and a foreshadowing of his death. So he defends her. Verse 10, then Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. He was rebuked in John chapter 12. He's rebuked here in Mark 14 for talking about or coming out or lashing out against this widow in, in, about the perfume. And I wrote that. And I just think it's one of those times when Judas has had enough. He's like, all right, fine. You've publicly humiliated me twice. I'm going to the priest. I'm going to get my revenge. And then in, in uh, Zechariah 11, 12, 11, yeah, Zechariah 11, uh, 12 and 13 is the prophecy of when he goes to the priest and sells Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. And that's what's happening. He's going to get his revenge. The devil enters him in one account. Uh, and by the way, if you want the devil to enter you, you, you can do that. I got a friend named Martin Chamorro who was a Satanist who gave his life to Christ. And we have talked at, at length of how he used to live his life as a Satanist. And how uh, he allowed the devil to enter his body. He allowed himself to be possessed. And um, a contrary, by the way, to the Eagles song, Hotel California, once you check in, you can never leave. God has the power to deliver you from Satanism. He has ultimate power. When the demons see him, they tremble and they flee. All you have to do is declare the name of Jesus Christ in repentance. Uh, just claim the blood of Christ. You can be delivered from Satanism, from possession. You can be delivered from drugs, alcohol, whatever it is you're dealing with. God has the power to do it. So um, just, just keep that in the back of your mind. Judas Iscariot allows the devil to enter him, and, it, and then he does things under the devil's influence. So they were delighted to hear. Uh, so the Judas, excuse me, let me start in verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priest to betray Jesus to them. He's mad. Second public uh, beratement by Jesus Christ. And they were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money. Now, that's the 30 pieces of silver. You can read that. I think it's in Matthew 26 um, and Luke 22. I didn't write those down, but it's somewhere around there. Um, and, uh, and watch for an opportunity to hand him over. This is Wednesday night. This is the betrayal of Christ. Um, this is the second time Judas gets rebuked, and this is what sets the ball rolling for his uh, betrayal and uh, his arrest. So just keep that in mind. Let me see what else I got here. Just notes. Oh, so Psalm 41.9, by the way, is another prophetic moment. Uh, Psalm 41 verse 9 talks about uh, the close friend who broke bread with Jesus Christ will lift his heel up against him. This is a referral to the betrayal of Judas as well. So just tying the Old Testament and the New Testament. You cannot teach the New Testament without the Old Testament. You have to have both because the Old Testament points towards the Christ of the New Testament. And the, the New Testament has all its foundation in the Old Testament. Fulfillment of prophecy and so on. So from Zechariah 11 to uh, Psalm 41, we have two prophecies fulfilled in this moment. Uh, also Genesis 3, and the Passover that they're celebrating this week that Jesus is referring to, two days before the Passover, he's coming in to celebrate the Passover, that has its roots in Exodus 12. So the Old Testament and the New Testament have to be used hand in hand to, uh, to prove the scriptures. And remember, at the time the disciples were preaching, the New Testament didn't even exist. They were preaching the fulfillment of the scriptures in the Old Testament, and that's the gospel. The gospel, the good news is all the things that pointed to Christ back in the Old Testament have come to fulfillment and fruition in the New Testament. So I've heard people say, uh, again, a big mistake in the church is we don't need the Old Testament. We just need the New Testament. Well, without the Old Testament, you have no basis for teaching the New Testament. I mean, you could teach it, but it loses a great amount of credibility and power by removing it from its foundation, which is the Old Testament. 
So just remember, keep that in mind if we look at that. So um, just a couple of notes. Every day, Luke 21, Jesus was teaching in the temple. At night, he would stay at the Mount of Olives, and every morning people would come to hear him teach. This is where we're at. This is Wednesday. Uh, we have uh, Mark 12, the widow. Okay, that was where, you know, we're talking about them arguing over this could have been given to the poor. Well, they had the poor coming to the temple. They were not taking care of them. Um, and that's about it. Let's just keep that right there. This is Wednesday. Je Jesus is anointed. This is his second anointing. And again, John chapter 12 is his first anointing prior to the triumphal entry where Mary anointed his feet. This is where they anoint his head. And the same argument ensues. Or you could look back and say, maybe this is a, and I looked at Matthew 26 on this one. Maybe this is a, like a, a flashback to him being anointed. But the difference is one was his head and one was his feet. Um, so in, Ma in Matthew 26, verse 6, it says Jesus was in Bethany at the home of a man known as Simon the leper. This is another thing. Look how specific. They give names and places specific to where Jesus is at this time. That brings great credibility to the historical context. Uh, again, credibility of the scriptures. So this is where we're at Wednesday night. Jesus is anointed for his burial. He defends the woman. And there's a four verse, uh, like apologetic there, defending her. So girls, be excited. Be encouraged. You have God's full support to be in ministry, to be out there um, helping people, to support your pastors, to, to help, you know, teach children sing, play the piano, all those things that you do. Again, the one office reserved for men, arguably, uh, according to the scriptures, is the, the head of elder, pastor, pastor, teacher. Uh, that's for men alone. You can argue with God over that. Rob isn't just making that up. So anyway, I hope everybody has a great day. Um, and uh, we'll see you all tomorrow. We'll, we'll begin here again in uh, Mark 14, uh, at verse 12. And uh, this is the conclusion of lesson number 48 in the book of Mark. So have, have a great week. Maybe a great weekend. Hopefully we'll see you tomorrow.